In this video, we will look at the features and characteristics of the graphs of polynomial functions. To start off, here's our standard form for a polynomial function. It can fit this pattern when we have it in expanded form, all multiplied out, not in factored form. We want to recognize that our terms here are in a descending order. So n is our degree. If you imagine maybe this is like a tenth degree polynomial, we'd have x to the tenth then a term with x to the 9th, 10 minus 1, then a term with x to the 8th, 10 minus 2, and so on all the way down until a term with just x to the first, regular x, and lastly with a constant. The a part, that stands for the coefficients. The n, the subscript down here, that's just our label so that we know which coefficient matches up with which term. So a sub n is the coefficient on x to the n, a sub n minus 1 is the coefficient on x to the power of n minus 1, and so on all the way down. a sub 1, coefficient of x with an exponent of 1, and a sub 0 is the constant. And you could even say that could, we could put an x to the power of 0 on this last term to even show the pattern continues all the way, and we know anything to the power of 0 equals 1. That's why we don't see it the way I've written it here. Some details about the polynomials we'll work with. All the coefficients are real numbers, and in order for it to actually be a polynomial, all the exponents are whole numbers. So no negative exponents, no fractional exponents. That's, that would make us not have a polynomial function, some other type of function. Two quantities that we care a lot about with polynomial functions are the degree n and the leading coefficient a sub n. As we begin to look at graphs, we will pay attention to how the graphs look compared to the degree of the polynomial and the leading coefficient. And specifically, we're really going to care about the sign of the leading coefficient. Is it positive or is it negative? Now let's look at a few examples of polynomial graphs or graphs of polynomial functions. As we go through a few, I want you to pay attention to just the overall shape of the graph, as well as what we could see about the domain of the graph, what possible x values we see. Here's f of x equals x squared minus 3x minus 2, a degree 2 polynomial. Here's a degree 3 polynomial, degree 4. Here's a degree 5 polynomial, interesting one. Here's x to the 8th minus x to the 7th minus x to the 6th minus x to the 5th minus 3x to the 4th plus 3x to the 3rd plus 2x squared plus 6. One thing you may have noticed is that as the degree increased, the graphs had more action to them. The quadratic, the degree 2 that we're used to, we know it's always a smooth parabola. And as the degree increased with these examples, we saw more twists and turns in the graph. What did you notice about the domain? The ends of each of these graphs would shoot up, but the domain is all real numbers. But let's go with that observation about what happens on the two sides of the graph. We would see them on the ends either skyrocket upward or downward. In some cases it was both up, and in other cases one side was down and the other side was up. But one thing that we definitely want to say about polynomial graphs is that they are continuous and smooth. The continuous part means that as we move from left to right, we're able to trace the whole graph without picking your finger up off of the paper. That's a continuous graph. No breaks like we have seen with piecewise functions. And also smooth. We don't have any sharp corners. Now with this graph, you might be looking down here and thinking, well, that seems like a pretty sharp corner. But if we zoom in on that point, it turns out to be just another curve like any other. The corner I'm thinking about that we don't see in polynomial functions would be like the corner of an absolute value function, for one example. We could zoom in as far as we want to that corner, and it's always going to appear as sharp as it did at its original view. Here's the graph of f of x equals square root of x. It is pretty smooth, and it is continuous once we're on the positive side, positive x values, but its domain is not all real numbers. We have no graph for negative x values. So another type of graph that we would not see of a polynomial function. Polynomial function, we will see it smooth and continuous and have a domain of all real numbers. Let's check out some other ideas by looking at a series of power functions. 
functions where it's just x to some exponent, only a single term. Here's our standard quadratic, the polynomial f of x equals x squared. And we're going to look at other power functions, but we're going to keep the exponent even to try to see some patterns here. Here's x to the fourth, x to the sixth. And again, it is staying smooth. It becomes steeper here for sure. But again, one of those cases where we could zoom in and see that it is still a smooth curve, no sharp corners. But let's talk about what we observe of the branches, the left side and the right side of these graphs. As long as the exponent is even, and I should say the degree is even, our highest exponent, these graphs all have branches that go up in the positive y direction. Here was one of our original functions. It's also degree 2, and we see that it also has the two ends increasing in the positive y direction. Here was our x to the fourth example from earlier, same behavior, and we'll call it now the end behavior. What happens on the two ends of the graph, the left end and the right end, and both are moving in the positive y direction. And here was that last example, x to the eighth, same end behavior as all of those other examples that had an even degree. Now let's look at negative x squared. Same even degree, but now we've made our leading coefficient negative. Maybe we remember from parabolas and quadratics that a negative leading coefficient means that we have a parabola opening down. And if you remember that, that's a great way to remember that if we have an even degree with a negative leading coefficient, the graph will always open down. We will see our two ends, the two branches, going in the negative y direction. There's negative x to the fourth, negative x to the sixth. And hopefully we understand that the negative out front of these power functions is just a reflection over the x-axis. Let's take a look at some of those other even degree functions, but we'll just flip the sign of the leading term. Now we have a negative x squared, and we see it's opening down. The two branches are going in the negative y direction. With these functions that have additional terms, flipping the sign of the leading term is not just a reflection. We could maybe see that from this example. We're only able to talk about the end behavior, that it's an even degree, but a negative leading coefficient. Our branches are going down. And lastly, there's our negative x to the eighth function. We've left all the other terms exactly the same, but we see the same end behavior of the other functions that had an even degree and a negative leading coefficient. Here's a standard cubic graph, f of x equals x to the third. We want to observe that we come from down here in quadrant three, negative y direction, and increase. We're going through the origin, and then we begin increasing in the positive y direction. So our branches, one is down and one is up. And let's see, as we increase our exponent, the graph has that same basic shape. It becomes steeper and a little flatter around the origin, but still it's a smooth and continuous polynomial graph. But the end behavior is the same for each of these power functions with an odd degree. The left branch is on the negative side, the right branch is on the positive side. Some of our earlier examples here, x cubed minus 3x squared minus 2x plus 1, same end behavior, left branches down and the right branches up. And here was our other example, the fifth degree polynomial. What happens when we reverse the sign of our leading coefficient? Here's negative x to the third, so our end behavior is reversed. Now, left branch is up and the right branch is down. We'll see that pattern continue. There's negative x to the fifth, negative x to the seventh. And those examples that had some other terms, the negative x cubed minus 3x squared minus 2x plus 1 has that same end behavior. Here's the graph where we reverse the sign of that leading coefficient. It, this time, it actually had some pretty considerable changes to the graph. So we don't want to make any assumptions about reflections just from changing the sign of one term but we can predict the end behavior. When I see this polynomial, it is a degree five, so the degree is odd. I know that my ends are going to be one up, one down. And since the leading coefficient is negative, the left branch is up, the right branch is down. So we'll summarize these observations, call it the leading term test. And we saw different examples for when 
our leading coefficient was positive or leading coefficient was negative. Remember, we're using a sub n for leading coefficient. And we also saw changes for when we had an even degree or an odd degree. So one by one, when we had an even degree polynomial, like an x squared parabola, and the leading coefficient was positive, we could say this about our end behavior. We're basically trying to just show the two branches how they look, but in the middle we really don't know exactly what's going on. That really depends on what all the other terms are. Leading term test is only about information we gather from that very first term, the degree and the leading coefficient. How would we describe the end behavior here with an even degree polynomial but a negative leading coefficient? So I'm thinking like a parabola that opens down. Now with a higher degree, 6 or 8 or 10, I won't know exactly what's happening in the middle, but I know exactly what the end behavior of the graph is. Next, let's cover these two cases for an odd degree. Odd degree, I just want to remember what that basic cubic graph looks like. With a leading coefficient that is positive, it will have this end behavior, left branch low, right branch high. And if we reverse the sign of that leading coefficient to a negative, our end behavior is reversed, so that the left side is high and the right side is low. Now, what information can we gather about what's happening in this middle part? We did say that from those earlier examples, we saw that the higher the degree, the more twists and turns we tended to see. It wasn't really an all-the-time rule, but a higher degree did give us more loops, and anything that's degree 2 is always going to be a parabola. We talk about turning points in this case. The graph of a polynomial of degree n has at most n minus 1 turning points. So a degree 2 can only have one turning point. Any degree 2 is going to be a parabola where the graph only turns once. It goes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, but it only changes once. But if we had a degree 8, we're saying it could have up to 7 turning points. Now, we can't say for certain that it will have 7. That definitely depends on all those other terms we might have. But it could have up to 7 turning points. So if I saw a graph and I saw about 5 turning points, I'd know for sure it's not degree 2, 3, or 4, or 5. It would have to be at least degree 6. Now let's recap some information that we know about quadratic functions in terms of factors and zeros and x-intercepts. When it comes to quadratic functions, we saw three cases. First example, f of x equals x squared. This is a case where we see only one intercept, that our graph touches the x-axis right on the vertex of that parabola. Well, let's take this function, f of x equals x squared, and let's find the zeros of the function. So we're setting this x squared equal to 0 and solving this quadratic. Now, x squared equals 0 has only the solution x equals 0 from the factor x, but it does have an exponent of 2, so we would say it has a multiplicity 2. And this is also helping us with this guide that the degree of the polynomial tells us how many zeros we should find. So when we see a degree 2 and we only see one x-intercept, we say this is because the 0 is actually a multiplicity 2. We recognize that it is there twice, so that fulfills the two zeros we would expect from a degree 2 polynomial. The x-intercept right here at the origin, right at the vertex of the parabola, our x-intercept can either cross right through the x-axis, or it can do what it does here, which is just touch it, or is tangent to the x-axis. This happens when we have zeros of an even multiplicity. So when we look at graphs, and we see that we have an x-intercept that is only tangent to the x-axis, we will know that it is a multiplicity 2, or multiplicity 4, or 6, or 8, and so on. So first case, an x-intercept where the graph just touches, and we know that's multiplicity 2, or a higher even number. Next case is, well, look at the x-intercepts we have here. We have actually two intercepts, so from a degree 2, I can see both x-intercepts. Let's handle this one the same way. Our function f of x equals x squared minus 1. We're going to find the zeros, so let's set it equal to 0 and solve. 
I'm going to choose solve by factoring for this one. We have a difference of squares factored as x plus 1 times x minus 1. And solving this now leaves us with x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 1. Each of those zeros is a multiplicity 1 because these factors do not have exponents of 2 or 3. No exponent we know is exponent 1. That's our multiplicity. Now going back to those x-intercepts, here we see them at negative 1 and positive 1. And now the intercepts actually cross right through the x-axis, where on one side of the intercept the graph is positive, the other side it's negative, or vice versa, if one side's negative, the other side is positive. And this is different from the last example where we just saw it touch, where both sides of the intercept were positive. And this, if it was open down, we would see both sides of the x-intercept were negative, but basically both sides had the same sign. This is something we want to observe about our intercepts. And when it crosses right through, this is when we have a multiplicity 1 or some other odd number. But I can tell you that when we see a graph cut right through the x-axis and it appears like a straight line just where it cuts through, that's multiplicity 1. If it was a multiplicity 3 or any other larger odd number, we would actually see the graph look like a cubic graph. It would move along the x-axis at that intercept. And we'll look at some of those examples pretty soon. But here is our second case of intercepts and factors and zeros, where we see two intercepts coming from two zeros. Each one is a multiplicity 1. And our graph cuts right through the x-axis. The third case is when we look at a graph and we see no x-intercepts. What is this connected to algebraically? We'll take the function f of x equals x squared plus 1, set it equal to 0 and solve. This time, well I can't factor, it's not a difference of squares, I'll solve this one with square roots. Move the positive one over to the right side, make it negative, square root both sides, square root negative 1 is i, and of course when we use square roots we have to account for a positive or a negative answer. So my zeros of this function are both complex, and that is the case when we do not see the x-intercepts. I know it's degree 2, so I should expect to see two zeros. And when I don't see any x-intercepts, I know that those two zeros had to be complex numbers. So we're starting to put together some pretty big ideas about polynomial functions and their graphs. When we see the degree, we can expect to have that many zeros, if we're careful about counting all the factors and zeros that have a multiplicity. And if I look at my x-intercepts, the difference between the degree and the number of intercepts is how many complex zeros we will have. So this example, degree 2, no x-intercepts, so the two zeros are both complex. Let's take this idea to the cubic graphs. So there's f of x equals x to the third. Let's take this function, let's find the zeros, x cubed equals zero. Well, there's the factor x equals zero, and exponent of three, so we have a multiplicity three. So we see our x-intercept, and it is crossing through in the sense that on the left side is negative, and on the right side is positive, so opposite sides have opposite signs, Definitely that's something that occurs for an odd multiplicity, 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. But when the multiplicity is 1, it really cut through like a straight line. And multiplicity 3, we see it move along that x-axis for a little bit. And that's a characteristic of multiplicity that's 3 or a higher odd number. To keep things interesting, let's look at this function, f of x equals x cubed minus 1. Algebraically, we will set it equal to 0 and solve. You might have an idea that, well, we know 1 to the third power equals 1, and I see the x-intercept of positive 1 right there. But we're building an idea that the degree of the polynomial is how many zeros we should expect to find. I see only one x-intercept, and it's crossing right through. It's not doing this kind of a move running along the x-axis. It's just cutting right through, suggesting that it's multiplicity 1. So we're looking for three zeros. One of them is the real one right here at positive 1. So there have to be two more complex zeros of this function. I'm going to solve by factoring, because I remember my pattern for 
difference of cubes, factored it would be x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1. So there's our factor x minus 1 that gives us the 0 x equals 1, and it is multiplicity 1. We have the exponent is just 1 on that factor. And from this factor is where we will get our two complex zeros. So what am I supposed to do with this? Can't factor that. Well, what you should do, one thing you can do at least, use quadratic formula. A is 1, B is positive 1, C is positive 1. So I'm going to the negative B plus minus square root B squared minus 4AC all over 2A formula. Negative 1 plus minus, there's the B squared minus 4 times a, t a times C, not so bad with all these 1's. So a little simplify, and we had a negative 3 in the radical. That's giving us the I outside of the radical. Clearly we've got complex numbers. So those are our last two zeros, the two complex zeros. You could leave it written this way, or you might want to look at it with it split up into two fractions. So we can see a real part, the negative 1 half, and the imaginary part, the radical 3 over 2i. So those are the two complex zeros. As we go further, much further, we'll do some very interesting things with these complex numbers and actually see a number exactly like this over and over again. But for now, we're building the idea that the degree tells us how many zeros to find. The x-intercept suggests if our zeros are real or complex and what those zeros might be. In this example, we saw an intercept where the graph cut right through at positive 1, that was our real 0 at x equals 1. Two missing x-intercepts must have been because we had two complex zeros for a total of 3. Now take a look at this graph and answer the famous question, what can you tell me about this graph? Well, let's start by trying to review all the things we've discussed so far. Let's start with the degree. Do we have an even degree or an odd degree? Remember, this is something we can tell from the end behavior. We see the left branch and the right branch, they're doing the same thing, both going up. So that means we have to have an even degree. Now what about the fact that both branches are up instead of down? That tells us something about our leading coefficient. So the leading coefficient is positive or negative. Well, the branch is going up, that's leading coefficient is positive. Next, we talked about all the twists and turns in between the branches. Thinking about the turning points, can we talk about what the degree might be for this one? Well, turning points where our graph changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. So it's turning here once, it's turning up here twice, or the second time, I should say, turning down here the third time, looks like a fourth turn and maybe a fifth turn right there. Five turns means it has to be at least degree six. And we picked an even number, so that was good. At least six, so it's degree six, maybe eight, maybe ten. Can't say for sure yet. Now let's talk about what we see of the intercepts. Looks like they're intercepts at positive one, negative two, positive three. But let's bring in these ideas about what the actual intercept looks like. Let's start with our intercept back here at negative 2. What would you say about the multiplicity? Do we have an even multiplicity or odd? And hopefully, since this part looks like a parabola, it's a reminder that that's an even degree, like a parabola is an x squared function. So with this intercept, it must be multiplicity 2, or some other even number. We don't want to assume that it must be a multiplicity 2, because all those other even multiplicities can have the same or a similar appearance. So let's just say that the multiplicity at negative 2 is even. How about the next intercept at positive 1? Cutting straight through, so on the safe side I could say it has an odd multiplicity, but it looks to me, just from its appearance as a straight line at the intercept, that it's probably multiplicity 1. Our last intercept at positive 3 it's doing this move where it's running along the x-axis for a bit. So that's an odd multiplicity again, but probably 3 or higher. We could say the multiplicity is an odd multiplicity, but it's not 1. Multiplicity 1 does more of a just cut right through, not a run alongside the x-axis. So as it turns out, this function is this x to the 6th minus 6x to the 5th 
plus 50x cubed minus 45x squared minus 108x plus 108. Some things I might want to notice. Well, our constant is always the y-intercept. That's something we could point out. We see it intercept the y-axis at positive 108. But confirm some of our information. So it was exactly degree 6, but we knew it was even and at least a degree 6. We got that the leading coefficient was positive. We got that from the end behavior. In terms of the intercepts, it's most helpful if we can look at the factors because we can relate factors to zeros, and zeros, if they are real, are x-intercepts. And as it turns out, this function, when it's factored, is x minus 3 to the third times x plus 2 squared times x minus 1. So this factor gave us the 0 at positive 3, and it was multiplicity 3. This factor, x plus 2, led to the 0 of x equals negative 2 back here, and it had a multiplicity of 2. And our last factor, x minus 1, was our 0 at this x-intercept, positive 1.